Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for giving me the honor to present uh, our latest work here, uh, which I have had the pleasure to work on with uh, Michael Hipke, who is in the audience here as well, and with um, Pierre Cavella from the University uh, of Chile and of the Observatory, uh, L'Observatoire um, de Paris. Once Breakthrough Starshot has been announced about a year ago, uh, I was intrigued by the question of whether it's possible at all to slow the sail down on the other side. Because um, if we think about a projectile, interstellar projectile, um, traveling at 20% 20 20 the speed of light, and if we assume um, that in situ exploration, close-up exploration, can done within, uh, say, just as an approximation within um, a distance to the planet that is equivalent to the lunar distance um, to the Earth, and it turns out that at 20% the speed of light, you traverse the diameter of the moon's orbit within about 13 seconds. That means after about 20 years um, of uh, interstellar travel, your uh, close-up explora exploration time versus the travel time is about uh, 1 over 50 million, which is rather low. So I was intrigued by the question of whether it would be possible to slow down and stay a little longer. Just for comparison, um, if we call this, this quantity t, so t star shot, the nominal value would be 1 over 50 million. And t for the New Horizon mission was about 1 over 10,000, right? And t of the Cassini mission was actually larger than 1 because it stayed longer than it required to travel there. So how can we slow down? Well, obviously, there is no laser array at, uh, on the other side, but there are stars. Stars emit light, photons um, carry momentum. So there is a photon pressure that could be used by the sail to slow down, to absorb the kinetic energy of the sail. Um, the, the photon pressure is given by, wow, this is a very not powerful laser. It's given by, um, by the equation. <laughs> This. Um, by this equation uh, in the upper right. So keep in mind that um, the photon pressure is proportional to the luminosity of the star. So obviously, we want to have a very luminous star. And also, it's proportional to, um, or it's, uh, it depends on, of course, on the distance, um, small letter r, to the star. So the closer you are to the star, the stronger. Um, your, your photon pressure and the stronger um, your deceleration if you convert this into a force that is if you multiply the pressure in the first line with the area A of, um, of the sail. So the question is, is there any plausible design of a sail that is that it's feasible to build in terms of the area and in terms of the mass? So is there any material that has a very low mass per surface um, ratio. We've done numerical as well as analytic uh, calculations that show that there is some part, that, that there is a sweet, a sweet spot in the parameter space given current or near future technology that might uh, allow an incoming sale to actually break down substantially. So in order to do a very quick um, analytical estimate, let's integrate um, the force, the photonic force, along the path, uh, along the trajectory of a sail that's coming in, then we can calculate the kinetic energy that is being absorbed, right? And we can convert this into um, a velocity that is being reduced. We call it V red. That is the, an estimate for the injection velocity, the maximum injection velocity of a sail that can be um, reduced or uh, absorbed. And if we put on nom nominal values of a sail that has an area of 10 square meters and that weighs 0.1 kilogram, right, that gives us a sigma that is a mass uh, per surface area of 10 gram per square meter, it turns out that if we would be able to approach the sun very closely, maybe as close as five solar radii, then the push would be very, very strong. However, the push, the photon pressure would even uh, would not be sufficient to push the sail away from the sun, but the sail would still drop into the sun. So we need to increase the area, and we need to make the sail even lighter. And there is a material 
I'm happy to show to you today. Uh, that's graphene. And if we might um, send these two samples through the audience, you will see that you can hardly see anything because it's mostly transparent. It only absorbs about 2% the speed of light, 2% uh, the light of the light that comes in. Is it possible actually for the camera to display this item here? It's coated with silver so you can see something. Hey. Sure. So let's see if you can improvise. So this one is coated with silver. Of course, it makes it very, very, very heavy, maybe 0.1 gram. <laughs> but what's nice about graphene is that um, the price for graphene has dropped by three, three orders of magnitude over the last decade. So if you scale this up to a sail that has a size of, say, 100 meter squared, that's 10 to the 4 square meters, and the price for graphene uh, continues to drop <laughs> by three orders of magnitude over the next 10 years, then this will cost less than a million euro, or dollar, I should say, per ginormous sale. So this is nothing that would cost billions of dollars per sale, but in principle, it might, uh, might, be, uh, might have a reasonable price. Turns out, if we plug in the numbers for graphene here for a large sale, and I'll guide you, guide you through this, then the method of deceleration over there might work. I'm showing you here some uh, simulation of what we refer to as a photogravitational assist. I'll, I'll replay this in a second. So think of this as the sail being symbolized by this dash over here. It comes in, it approaches the star, and it's then being deflected by the photon pressure of the star. And after it passes the star, we assume that we would rotate the sail, maybe make it um, say, edge onto the star to prevent re-acceleration. Let's see if I can play that again. Yep, so it comes in. We maximize the force by rotating um, the sail in, in the perfect way as we approach. And after we have passed the closest point to the star that's symbolized by this small uh, red circle over there, we make it edge on to the star. So we maximize the deceleration as we come in. And in this fiducial example, uh, we can slow down by about 1,000 kilometers per second, which is rather slow. I think it's a fraction of a percent uh, a speed of light. Well, it's about a percent the speed of light. But that's not graphene, right? That's 0.1 gram per square meter. Graphene is even lighter, has an even, li uh, even lower mass per surface um, ratio. You can find this plot actually in a paper that I refer to in the upper left, col uh, upper left uh, corner. And in the upper right corner, that's the archive IDs. If you're interested, you can find our latest paper that we just put uh, on Astro page uh, about a week ago. Right. So if we do this exercise, um, these numerical simulations, as well as the analy analytical simulations um, for Proxima, right? is it possible to go to Proxima and slow down to a rest, that is to stop there, do a full stop? and maybe even go in orbit around Proxima b. Well, it turns out that for a graphene class sail, the maximum speed that you can absorb over there by the stellar radiation is rather low, 1,270 kilometers a second. And if you transfer, uh, translate this into a travel duration, that you come up with about 1,000 years. So you cannot possibly go uh, directly to Proxima with a graphene class sail and come to a rest over there. What is nice, though, is that Alpha Centauri C, or Proxima, is the companion of a much more massive binary. So these two stars, Alpha Centauri A and B, are more or less sun-like. So they emit much more light per time. They have much higher luminosities. And what we actually propose is to use these two stars as kind of um, pinball photon bumpers, right? So you go to Alpha Centauri A first, make a swing by a photogravitational assist to B, and then you go to C. Turns out the maximum injection speeds um, are a significant fraction of the speed of light, 5% the speed of light, almost 6%. So it translates into about 70 to 90 years of travel, depending on the orientation of the, or the, the uh, orbital alignment of the binary upon um, arrival of the sail. So this is a simulation that Pierre Kevela made for us. 
We take a nominal start from Earth or from the Sun in about 18 years from today. Right? We reach the system or the binary system AB in about the year 2092 because this is when the system, well, that is the two components A and B, they align nicely for the sail to be optimally deflected. So the sail comes in here with a high speed. It's slowed down on the 9th of December, 20, 20, uh, 2092, right? <laughs> About 3 p.m. And then it's um, slowed down by another 8,000 kilometers a second after about six days of travel. Now, the thing is, because Proxima only absorbs 1,270 kilometers a second, you are very slow now in order to come to rest down here. That is, you need another 40 years of travel for only a fraction of the distance. But that's how it is. So if you add up the two, um, the two times of travel, turns out you need, where are the numbers? Uh, I converted it into speeds here, and these are the travel times. So you can go into a bound orbit around Alpha Centauri A or B after about 75 years of travel, and then you need about another 45 years to go uh, to Proxima. So that adds up to um, about two um, li uh, human lifespans. Right. And the, the potential of this um, additive nature of what we refer to as the uh, photogravitational assist, of course, depends on the alignment of the AB binary. So there are orbital phases that make it an ideal target for the maximum injection speed. And there are phases where the injection speed will have to be lower because you need a larger deflection, which is only possible if you are somewhat slower. So what we did here, we present this in our second paper, is we can compute the time of arrival um, as a, a function of departure here. Because <laughs> the, at the time of arrival, you will have a certain injection speed, which means that you have had a certain amount of travel time, which then you can calculate back uh, into a uh, year of departure. Turns out, if you want to um, arrive at Alpha Centauri A and B in the year what is that, 2092, with the optimal, with the minimum times of uh, travel duration, you would have to uh, depart in 2017. That is tomorrow, <laughs> which won't work. <coughs> right. Um, so, as kind of um, a summary of uh, of our work, I would say that there are. Uh, we, we identified a couple of um, major items or research areas related to this um, optimization of trajectories, which I would say is firstly, of course, in the development of these ultra-thin, highly reflective photon sails, which could possibly be graphene-based. And of course, we have to talk about aiming accuracy because it turns out we actually don't know where to go. Um, if we would have a t tangential accuracy or offset, uh, of about a stellar radius once, once we arrive at Alpha Centauri A. This translates into a funnel accuracy of maybe eight milli arc seconds, which means that once you're at the distance of the moon, you would have to hit a hole that has a diameter of 16 meters. However, the proper motion accuracy is only 3.6 milli arc seconds per year. That means in 20 years from now, this translates into an, accuracy of, uh, in, into an inaccuracy of 0.1 astronomical units. So it could be that we travel there and the planet is at the other side and we don't, we don't even hit it. Also, we have to talk about velocity accuracy. So if you're off in your terminal um, speed by a fraction of the percent of the speed of light, you can arrive a couple of days too early and the planet, which has an orbital period of, say, 11 days, is just at the other side. So you miss it by um, about 0.1 AU. Right. And of course, the sail that I'm envisioning, at least, will have to have some sort of autonomy. It will have to have some sort of onboard propulsion to do course corrections. It will need camera systems not only to send back uh, pictures, but also to do its own uh, navigation. Of course, it will, to have, will have to manage the impacts that um, will change its reflectivity and so on. And of course, it will have to have a software that's, pos uh, that's uh, able to, to calculate um, it's, it's, um, or to update the best possible trajectory um, that, is, that is still ahead. And of course, you can do those photogravitational assists also beyond Alpha Centauri. So we propose to, to apply this to the most nearby stars, and it turns out that Sirius, if you are able to um, accelerate, 
accelerate to about 20% the speed of light. Sirius has the shortest travel time that allows you a full stop, which is, which is mostly because it's so luminous. So after a travel duration of a bit less than 70 years, assuming a graphene-based sail, you can come to a full stop. So you can even explore a white dwarf because Sirius A has a, a white dwarf companion. And I'd like to finish with a couple of um, citations here, and I'm very happy to receive your questions. Thanks. Uh, just a brief comment before we take uh, questions. Um, this is an example for research that uh, was done as, uh, independently of the Starshot Advisory Committee. And, um, we announced the project uh, a year ago. Uh, the first paper that we submitted for publication in the Astrophysical Journal uh, was about the risks from dust. And one of the editors of UPJ, the Astrophysical Journal, commented that this is not astrophysics. Uh, and then we argued the case, the, and the paper was accepted for publication that it is astrophysics. And by now, the Astrophysical Journal Letters, for example, receives routinely uh, papers and publishes them uh, on Starshot Science. So I very much encourage anyone interested in this project to um, write scientific papers. We very much welcome th those. Uh, there were a number of hands raised. Uh, let's start, please. I'll say it loudly. So the, the idea, exposing you, oh, thank you. Exposing you had a fleet of 1,001 of these. So you got 1,001 highly reflective sails. And 1,000 of those are Sort of, the, they do the flyby, but sacrifice themselves in the sense that they orient themselves to reflect back the light of Centauri B to the one sail that's the lucky one that's going to stay behind. What would be what would be the math to say how many of those sacrificial reflectors? So you got them all flying by doing good science, but a thousand of them reorient themselves to reflect back the light to the precise point of the single <coughs> sail that's going to decelerate. So you're thinking about kind of a multi-mirror telescope yeah. made up of sails? Yeah, they're all flying by. They're all doing you know, mm -hmm. good science. Sweet. But mm -hmm. one of them mm -hmm. is going to be the lucky one to catch the light of a 1,000 mm -hmm. or 10,000 or whatever the math lines up to. Mm -hmm. What would it be? Sounds very interesting. What's your question exactly? It, it, was that considered? Is there anything behind that? Is it a fantasy? Uh, no, 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 and no, I guess. But it's, <laughs> it's the first time I heard about this idea. Um, it, it seems very, 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 very hard for me to achieve. We have time for one more question. Jill? So, um, what about? Phil's idea where the sail is smart and everything is on the sail, what's the adding the mass of that to the small mass of the yeah, graphene That's a very good question. So in order to make the additional mass of the payload, say, scientific payload, negligible, that is, if you want to add a gram or 10 gram and still have the sigma, that is the mass per surface ratio small, you need a large surface. So it is the mass of the payload becomes negligible compared to the mass of the sail. That is, you need a sail that is 100 meters squared of the order of, roughly speaking. So if you have a very large sail, you can add 10 gram of payload, 15 gram of payload, wouldn't make too much uh, of a difference. Also, the travel speed or vice versa, the travel velocity only goes with the square root of sigma. So if you double your mass, given the same area, you will have a factor of 1.4 for the travel duration. So that's good. Okay, we are two and a half minutes behind schedule, uh, so we'll uh, go out for a break of seven and a half minutes and come back here.